we're going to look at how pointers work in Rust, which you've encountered certainly in the programs you've written so far. So we started talking about whether memory is managed explicitly or automatically and the kinds of issues that causes and the dangers that happen if programs have too much control over memory. And we're going to get into how memory management works in Rust today. So we talked last class about two basic kinds of memory management. That what we have in C and C++ is unmanaged memory, where programmers can manage memory how they want, and it's completely up to the programmer to free objects. You've also programmed in languages that have automatic memory management, which is true for all of these. Um, Java, you've certainly programmed in Python, Scheme, Go, and C Sharp. All of these automatically reclaim storage. It's not up to the programmer to say when they're done by calling free or delete the way they do in C and C++. It's up to the compiler and the runtime system to reclaim storage. And the way that's done is primarily through garbage collection. We talked briefly about this last class, but I want to recap how garbage collection works in languages like Java and Go. And the basic idea for garbage collection is very simple, and this goes back to Lisp in the 1950s and 1960s. What does it mean for an object to be garbage in a program? Yes. OK, so that's a pretty strong definition. So it's garbage if, if the program is never going to use it again. Right? So if it, we're at point P, and we know that this object will never be used again, then it's useless to keep that object in memory. Is that what it means when these languages do garbage collection? Are they having that strong a definition of garbage? Are they able to predict the future well enough to know whether you'll use that object again? How do these define garbage? Yeah, out of scope. Um, we're sort of on the right track, so certainly that's one way something could become garbage. What does it mean in general to be garbage? Yeah, yeah there's no way to reach it. Right, so this is a much weaker definition of garbage than what we'd really desire, which was the anything that's never going to be used again is garbage. But predicting whether an object's going to be used again is very difficult. Figuring out whether you can reach it at least in these languages, is pretty easy. Garbage means unreachable. And this is a conservative definition of garbage. So there's lots of garbage objects in your program that you'll never use again, but because they're reachable, they're not going to be collected. And the way a mark and sweep collector works is you try to figure out everything that's reachable. You know the stack is reachable, and anything that you can reach from the stack is reachable. And anything that you can reach from objects that you can reach is also reachable. The way the market sweep collector works is you start with some collection of objects that you know are reachable, either because they're global references to them or they're references on the stack, and you keep following those. You find that the closure of following all those references and all of those are marked as reachable, everything else is garbage. You walk down all these pointers to find all the things that you could reach, mark those as non-garbage, and everything else is garbage. What are drawbacks of doing garbage collection this way? Yes. OK, good. So it certainly looks really slow. If we have to walk through all of memory, if we have to follow all pointers to touch all objects. If we're running a program with lots of objects, that's really expensive. It's going to take a long time. The solution that people have come up with for that is what's known as generational garbage collection. And this is the way almost all Java implementations do garbage collection today. You try to infer objects that are likely to not be garbage, so you don't have to keep checking them. The way generational gar garbage collectors do this is they assume if an object survived garbage collection a few times, that probably means it's going to have a long lifetime, and we don't need to keep checking if it's garbage. So what a generational garbage collector does is it divides storage into a few areas, and sometimes they actually call it tenured, that once an object has passed garbage collection a few times, it moves into the tenured part of memory, which doesn't get garbage collected very often. So you can have multiple generations, and you're going to run garbage collection on this space frequently, and things migrate over to the tenured space where you don't run garbage collection very often. Unlike tenured professors, you still get to garbage collect tenured objects that they don't stay around forever, but you don't garbage collect them very often. So that's one way to make it faster, so you don't have to look at all of memory. And this works pretty well for most programs. Isn't guaranteed to work well for all programs. The other problem with it is if you're 
you know, I'm drawing memory as just blobs in space. If we want to get good performance, we want all the active memory to be close together. We've collected some objects that are no longer used, and now what's actually in memory has these big spaces that are unused and objects sort of scattered around memory. What we would like to have is all the objects that we're using be close together in memory so we get good caching performance. So the other thing garbage collectors do is compact. They try to move things around, so when you're doing this mark and sweep, instead of leaving things where they are, you can move them to be close together so you're going to get better caching performance. So there's a lot of effort that goes into make gar making garbage collection better, and it still has a uh, some things that are going to be fundamentally hard, right? So if you've got to identify all these garbage objects, at some point you've got to walk all of memory. You've got to follow all these references. And that's always going to be expensive. If you remember the comic book that introduced Chrome, it had a more advanced version of garbage collection described in the comic book that talked about both of these things. It is able to keep track of where things are on the stack, and this is a garbage collector for Java. So this is the V8 JavaScript interpreter that's in Chrome. It can keep track of objects because they are well-typed. It is using incremental garbage collection. So I actually didn't, didn't mention that. So what? So the generational means we don't necessarily have to look through all of memory every time, but we still have to look through a lot. They, they did have generational. It's not in the comic book. Why is incremental important? Incremental means we don't have to do the whole thing at once. And remember, we said to do garbage collection, we've got to basically stop all the threads that might be modifying that memory. Because if pointers change in the middle of a mark and sweep, well, we've lost track of things that are reachable and things that are not. So we've got to stop all the other activity while we do garbage collection. Is it important that we can make it incremental, that we don't have to run the entire garbage collector, meaning run the garbage collector following all the references, garbage collecting this entire space all at once? Why might someone implementing a garbage collector for a browser like Chrome care about this? So how long do you think it takes to do a garbage collection? Is it long enough for a human to notice? Well, so for several million cycles, would it be long enough for a human to notice? How long does it take to do a few million cycles? How many cycles do we get a second? Yeah, so we have a 4 gigahertz processor. We're getting 4 billion cycles per second. So if it was just a few million, that's order of milliseconds or less than milliseconds. Humans can't notice that. Right. The problem is it's actually hundreds of milliseconds to do garbage collection. So it is enough for humans to notice, and it can be you know, as long as half a second or so to do, do garbage collection. And this was the case in browsers before Chrome, and even after that, if you look at Firefox, Firefox did not have incremental garbage collection until two years ago. And if it takes long enough for a human to notice garbage collection, if it happens when a human is doing something where it matters how long things take, like playing a game or watching a video, that's a big deal. So this is why, why they did it. And if you look at this post, this is what was happening with regular mark and sweep. The garbage collector runs, and whatever frame was supposed to be rendered, I think this was, was a game demo they made, has to wait for the garbage collector to finish. And the garbage collector was taking a few hundred milliseconds. So that's two tenths of a second. That's definitely enough time for a human to notice. Like a tenth of a second is about the, the threshold of what humans notice. So taking a quarter of a second is definitely enough for humans to notice. And if you're watching a video, you're going to see it get stuck. If you're playing a game that's a real-time game, you're going to get shot because the other players can shoot you when you are stuck not being able to move for a quarter second. They changed garbage collection to be incremental, which means instead of having to do one long garbage collection that takes 200 milliseconds, they can subdivide that into many smaller ones that take below some time that's just about below the threshold of what humans can notice. That's definitely an improvement, even if the total time you spend on garbage collection might go up, at least for the kinds of interactive things you might do with a web browser. So what's the most incremental garbage collection we could do? How far could we take this? So rather than periodically calling the garbage collector, can we tell as the program executes right away when some storage is no longer needed, when some storage becomes garbage? Is there a way to tell right away? Or do we have to always stop the execution and walk the, walk the stack and heap to figure out if something became garbage. Yes? Good, yeah. So if, if our definition of garbage is, is there a way to reach this, as part of the execution, we can keep track of that. We can keep track of how many references there are to some storage, and we can reclaim that storage as soon as we lost the last reference. 
And this is what's called reference counting. Reference counting is basically the idea that you make garbage collection totally incremental. For each object, you keep track of the number of references to that object. And every time you do something that changes that, you update that count. This is what Python does. There are definitely other languages that people use that do reference counting as their main way of doing automatic memory management. It's not the only thing that Python does, and we'll see why it's not the only thing later, but it's the main thing that Python is doing to do memory management. How does this work? So if we're going to count references, here's our code. This is sort of Java pseudocode. New T creates some new object, and we're going to associate with each object a reference count. So how many references are there to this object when we create it? So what should the reference count be at this point? So do you understand what the reference count means? It's the number of different ways we can reach that object. When we are inside the constructor, so we're inside the constructor, the constructor can reach the object, and our reference count should be one. What happens when we return from the constructor? So we go out of scope, right? So there was a constructor that created this object. Let's say there was some local variable that it's doing all this construction, and then we're done with the constructor. So what happens when we're done with the constructor code? OK, so it seems like it sort of goes to 0, because right? the constructor no longer references it. But before the constructor loses that reference, what else happens? Yeah, so we're swapping the reference here. right? So we had this reference. Now we've got this one. The reference count should never actually hit 0. right? If there was some time between those two events when the reference count was 0, then that object would be reclaimed before we actually get the reference to the local variable to it. So we need to make sure the reference count doesn't hit zero when an object is being transferred either passed as a parameter or returned as a result. That reference is being exchanged and never should go to zero. So then we get to here. So now we're doing an assignment. Does that assignment affect the reference count? OK, good. How does that affect the reference count? Good. So that's going to increase the reference count. So now y is also a reference to the same object. And when we do an assignment that gives us a new reference to that object, we need to increase the reference count. So now, let's say we had another assignment. Let's say we did x is some new object. What would that do to the reference count? So there are three choices. It could increase it, decrease it, or leave it the same. Should we have a vote? See if people are paying attention. Okay, so how many people think the reference count should increase? How many people think it should stay the same? How many people think it should go down? So we don't have a real clear it looks like it's between stay the same and go down. Can we figure out which one it should be? So we're doing an assignment. Before this assignment happened, how many different ways could we reach this object? Yeah. There were two different ways. We could reach it through x, and we can reach it through y. Now we did this assignment, and now x is going to point to some new object. So now how many ways can we reach this object, which was the one we're talking about the reference count for? Right. So when we do an assignment that takes something that used to be able to reference this object and makes it point to something else, then we've lost a reference to this object. The other way we can lose it is if we go out of scope. If y was in this scope, once we go out of scope, we've lost that variable. We don't have that reference anymore. So that's the other way the reference count can go down. So at that point, it would go to 0. And once the reference count reaches 0, that means that object is garbage. That's exactly our definition of garbage, is it's an object that there's no way to reach. If you look at the way Python is implemented, so this is the implementation of the list object in Python. This is exactly what it's doing. So in list depend, we're passing in a Python object that's getting appended to a list. That means the number of references to that object increased by one. References aren't just variables. Now that object's an element in a list, the other way we can reach it is by indexing through that list and getting to that element. That's why we're incrementing the number of references to it. What increment does is just add one to the reference count. So every object in your running Python program no matter how simple the object is, it's got an extra field that is counting the number of references. When it's new, it starts at 1. When some new way of referencing it is added, it's increased. When it's decreased, we're subtracting 1 from the reference count. If it is equal to 0, so this is not equal to 0, what do you think that check is doing? Can you guess what that macro I haven't shown you is doing? If you know both Python and C, it would help, but you can probably guess without. So if the reference count is not equal to 0, what should it be? Let's look at the other branch first, mate. So if it is equal to 0, that means it's garbage. Right? And we're calling dealloc that says, right away, we don't have to wait to run a garbage collector. We know this object is garbage. We can deallocate that space and start reusing it. So there's no, no need to wait until a garbage collector runs. If it's not 0, it's not collected. Right? We're assuming it's not garbage because there's still some way to reach it. 
What do we think the pi check ref count macro is doing? Maybe it's hard to get. If it's not zero, what should it be? Yeah, it should be positive. Right, so that's exactly what it's doing. This looks sort of strange, right? You would say, if the ref normally you would think of writing this as, if the reference count is greater than zero, it's not garbage. Otherwise, it's zero and you collect it. This is defensive programming in the Python interpreter saying if it's not equal to zero, let's check and make sure it's positive. If it's a negative number, something really bad happened and our program should fail and there's some bug in the Python interpreter. Reference counting seems like a really nice thing. We wanted incremental fast garbage collection. This is the most incremental we can get. Why are Java and JavaScript and Go and all these languages not using reference counting? First question, does it always collect all the garbage? Good, yeah. So the problem with reference counting is we might not actually catch everything. We could have two objects like this. So there are two objects that reference each other, but neither one is reachable. There's no local variable, there's no other object we can use to reach either of these, but their ref counts are both going to stay at one. Certainly reasonable to build a data structure like this. We could have started with a local variable that points to one of these, have that structure, once this is done, so there would have been two references, once we lose this, now they each have one, but neither one is actually reachable. So what you would want, if there's no way to reach anything in this loop, all of these objects are garbage, but they all have a reference count of one because they're reachable from another garbage object. This kind of problem can grow to arbitrarily large objects, and it does. This is why Python, in addition to the reference counter, still has a garbage collector that runs once in a while to collect this type of garbage that isn't caught by the reference count. Here's an example in code that sets that up. We have object A, references object B. They have references to each other. When we go out of scope, we've lost those references, but those two objects are still gonna have one reference each, so they won't ever be reclaimed without also having a garbage collector. This is one big problem with reference counting. You're not gonna collect all the garbage. The other problem is you can't do the compacting. If you wanna get good performance from your memory subsystem, you want to be able to move objects around, and reference counting doesn't provide an easy way to do that the way Mark and Sweep does.